Rotary cathodes butter zone hardware and process optimization using advanced finite element analysis. In this presentation, we are going to go over why we run simulations on specific hardware configurations, what properties are simulated, a sputtering application example including hardware selection workflow, simulation assumptions, and then review the simulation results. So on why to run simulations, well most users are primarily concerned with optimizing the deposition rate, coding uniformity, the coding homogeneity, the target utilization, and hardware maintenance. For the deposition rate, we'll look at material dependent deposition rates as a function of the sputter process calculator. We'll look at the maximum power density for the target as a function of the target cooling simulations. We'll look at the sputter flux collection efficiencies as a function of the magnetics, so we know where the plasma is on the surface of the substrate, and then the rest of the code zone geometry. For coding uniformity, we're going to look at the target length, which defines the uniform deposition area, the code zone geometry, which includes the condensate shield locations, and magnetics, which defines our deposition angles. For coating homogeneity, we'll look at the gas distribution, which is extremely important for reactive sputtering, since the local partial pressure of the reactive gas will determine the product that is created. The coat zone geometry, which will look at the pumping symmetry. We'll look at magnetics for the deposition angle to determine uh, where our sputtered material is going to go. And then also the sputter flux travel distance to determine the scattering and film density. For hardware maintenance, we look at the sputter flux collection efficiencies to determine the amount of material that lands on the substrate compared to the surrounding coder surfaces. For our sputter application example, we're going to start off with SiO2 on a 750 millimeter wide glass substrate with a less than plus or minus 3% uniformity across the substrate and a maximum deposition rate, which is required to reduce the number of cathodes and maximize the line speed. So we'll be running at a fairly high power density. And then also a 90 millimeter target to substrate distance, otherwise known as the TTS. For our hardware selection workflow, we'll start off by calculating the target length. We'll determine the initial process conditions. We'll simulate the target heating. Simulate the sputter flux and then optimize the magnet bar angles. To calculate the target length, we'll start off by using the online uniformity calculator. We'll put in our backing tube length at 1110 millimeters, the TTS or our target to substrate distance at 90 millimeters, and our substrate width at 750 millimeters. Now on the right you can see the plot that is produced by this calculator. It has the uniformity plot and is the blue line and then the vertical red lines indicate the edges of the substrate. So we have a overhang of a approximately 180 millimeters so that's total length of the cathode that is of the target material that is sticking out over the edges of the substrate and then we have an overhang factor of a four times TTS and then that produces our theoretical uniformity of plus or minus 2.14%. Next, we need to determine the initial process conditions using the online process calculator that is also available on the Sputtering Components website. Start off by inputting the TTS, which is 90 millimeters, the TTS multiplier, which we received from the previous calculator, that is 4, the substrate width, which is 750 millimeters, and the backing tube length comes out at 1110 millimeters. Next, we select our target material of silicon and below we can see that the maximum power rating is 27.8 kilowatts. So for our initial global assumptions, we start off with AC power has a 50% duty cycle. 80% of the power applied to the cathode from the power supply is turned into heat. So if we start with 27 kilowatts on our power supply and multiply that by the 50% duty cycle, and then the 80% heat conversion factor, that gives us 10.8 kilowatts. 
So 10.8 kilowatts of heat is applied to the racetrack shape on the target surface and then has to be removed by the water cooling. The target rotation of 10 RPM. We have 20 degrees Celsius cooling water inlet temperature. A 27 kilowatt divided by two cathodes times our minimum water flow requirement of one liter per minute per kilowatt gives us a water flow of 13.5 liters per minute per target tube in the AC pair. We have a stainless steel backing tube. We also assume constant sputter flux as a function of surface area for the modeled plasma zone. And then lastly, we assume that the gas distribution and pumping are uniform. So next we have our 3D model that we create in SOLIDWORKS. This is a model of the water cooling passageway. We have the inlet in the lower left. We have four plastic discs along the length of the inside of the target. We have the magnet bar pointed upwards. And we have the outlet on the right hand side just to simplify the uh, simulation. Next, we add the target tube and plasma. So for reference, we still have our inlet on the lower left-hand side. Then we have our plasma on the surface of the target material right above the magnet bar. We have our silicon target material on the outside and our stainless backing tube on the inside. Next, we need to add our material and boundary conditions. So we start off by putting 13.5 liters per minute of inlet flow at 20 degrees Celsius into the inlet. And then we add our plasma heat source of 10.8 kilowatts onto the actual boundary that is the plasma erosion zone. Then we put a 10 RPM rotation on the entire target tube while keeping the interior magnet bar uh, static. Then we put 50 psi of outlet water pressure on the right hand side. And then we assume that the target is thermally insulated and is only transferring the heat from the plasma to the water through that water to metal interface. So next is our results which shows our surface temperature. We have a maximum surface temperature of 134 degrees Celsius. Next, we have our water flow velocity profiles. These are streamlines that actually show the direction that the water is flowing and is colored for temperature. So we have a temperature rise of 22.5 degrees Celsius. And we have a 31.9 degrees Celsius outlet water temperature. So if actually running this, the customer would be able to measure the outlet water temperature to verify if the simulation is accurate. Next, we'll actually take the target material surfaces, the OD on the left and the ID on the right, and we'll unwrap them. And on the left-hand side, we'll look at the target OD temperature. So as the target material is turning and um, the heat is going basically from left to right across the target surface. You can see the pattern that it makes. It's a, um, and the influences of the disks that are in the water cooling pathway and how they add extra cooling in between the, uh, um, the sections. And then on the ID water profile velocity on the right hand side, you can see again the influence of the disks. And in both of these, the inlet is on the bottom. So you can see there's a slight temperature gradient on the left hand side from the inlet at the bottom where we have a temperature of 53.8 degrees Celsius all the way up to the top. And then on the right hand side, you can see that the disks are creating a higher water velocity and that the water velocity is also much higher over the surface of the magnet bar. So next we can look at a target material cross section. Again, the target material is rotating counterclockwise. We have a 135 degrees C maximum temperature, 
which is on the right hand side um, just underneath the uh, the erosion zone and then we have a 90 degrees Celsius minimum temperature so as that target material is rotating around it is decreased all the way to 90 degrees Celsius before it re-enters the plasma. Next we will look at the target cooling water cross-section. This is the water that is traveling through the target tube around the magnet bar and this cross-section is taken at the hottest point on the target surface. The maximum water temperature is 42.5 degrees Celsius and you can see that is in the red section which is above the water tube in the center and is the furthest away from the magnets which is really important because the highest water temperatures are nowhere near the magnets which makes sure that our magnets stay cool. So for our thermal simulation conclusions we have a maximum target temperature which equals 135 degrees Celsius. The target is not in any danger of melting, overheating, or cracking due to thermal expansion. The maximum water temperature equals 42.5 degrees Celsius which there's no danger to the magnets because that hottest water temperature was way away from them. And that the temperature change around the magnets is minimal since the water velocity around them is also very high. Next we will look at the sputter flux simulation. We'll model the 1110 millimeter targets with, in a system with two cathodes a 200 millimeter cathode to cathode spacing, use the MCD end blocks, TRM magnet bars, a 90 millimeter TTS, the 750 millimeter wide substrate, and a 450 millimeter wide by 340 millimeter deep by 1400 millimeter tall chamber. Next we have the results for the molecular flow modeling. On the right hand side we have the 3D model that shows the results of where the molecules are landing on the surfaces in the chamber going from blue or with a zero flux all the way to red with the highest flux. You can see there are two vertical lines on the substrate that represent where the majority of the flux is landing on the surface of the substrates. And then you can also see on the right hand side of the model a small amount of material in a lighter blue section above and below the substrate on the sidewalls. Uh, we've broken down this information into the graph shown on the bottom left, which is the sputter zone collection efficiency data. On the dark space shields, which are around the end block and the end support, there's very little material. On the target tube, so sputtering from target to target, um, there's a little bit more material. And if you look at this graph, we have it broken up into two different parts. We have straight, which means that the magnet bars are pointed directly at the substrate, and then we have seven degree tilt, which means that both the magnet bars are tilted in towards each other at seven degrees. And so we can see the differential between the amount of material that lands um, on the different surfaces as a function of those angles. So for the top and the bottom wall, there's not much change. Um, back to the target tube, you can see that there's a small change. On the surface that is behind the substrate there's virtually no change very very small change um, and that's mainly due to the total collection efficiency on the side walls is where we see the largest change so that is the wall on the left hand and the right hand side and when we're at straight we have much more material landing on the side walls than we are tilt than when we are tilted in at uh, um, seven degrees and then on the substrate you can see that we have a slightly higher overall collection efficiency on the substrate with a seven degree tilt. So now if we take just the substrate portion from the previous uh, simulation and we look at the straight and the seven degree tilt versions of that simulation, you can see on the left hand side, the, again, those nice two horizontal lines that are separated by a little bit of the yellow in between for the straight and then on the right hand side we have the seven degree tilt where those two red lines are becoming closer together and then the profile in between them is also becoming much darker. Now we can take the static uniformity results from the previous slide and create a dynamic uniformity. This is calculated by creating horizontal summation lines across the 2D static deposition profiles on the previous slide. It assumes a constant sputter rate along the entire erosion zone. 
So the turnarounds are not operating at a different erosion rate than the straightaway, which is not exactly correct. And a plus or minus 1.75% uniformity is what we get for the uh, straight and the 7 degree tilt. And the calculator gave us around a plus or minus 2.15%. And the ripple in the simulations results is a factor of the low mesh density. So if we were to increase the mesh density, we would see a nice curved line just like what we see with the calculator. So in conclusion, the use of finite element analysis to simulate production sputtering systems has become a practical and time-saving tool for use with new and existing systems. And the results show how the processes can be improved while staying within the limits of the existing hardware. And as the software continues to improve, the speed and accuracy of the simulations also greatly improve. Thank you for your attention, and if you want any more information, please visit our website at www.sputteringcomponents.com.